Hello anatomy and physiology lab students. Welcome to your second online lab. This lab looks at the anatomy of the urinary system. The urinary system is a very important body system because it helps to cleanse the blood of metabolic byproducts such as urea. It also helps to regulate water balance and it also regulates the balance of certain electrolytes and ions in the body. Finally, it's also very important for maintaining proper acid-base balance in the body. So let's look inside. Okay, first of all, you can see an internal view of the human torso. In order to see the urinary organs, we actually have to pull out the intestines, the stomach, uh, the liver, and then we can see the kidneys. In actuality, the kidneys are not in the abdominal cavity. They're actually behind it, uh, covered by a sheet of peritoneum, which has been removed here. So technically, we would say that the kidneys are located retroperitoneally. So again, the primary organs of the urinary system are here are the kidneys, where blood is filtered. Okay, left and right kidneys, and then we have above the kidneys, just to point out, we have our adrenal glands, which are part of our endocrine system, and then leading down from the kidneys are our ureters. The ureters transport urine to our urinary bladder, which is located down below here. Now, it's important to point out that there's a little invagination on each kidney called the renal hilum or renal hilus. We saw something like this in the respiratory system, in the lungs. So this is the area where the blood vessels and the ureters arise and we have a renal artery and renal vein, and we'll take a look at those in just a minute. Okay, let's take a look at the sagittal section of the kidney. First of all, the kidney is surrounded by a fibrous connective tissue capsule called the renal capsule, okay? And beneath that, we have an area called the renal cortex. Now remember that the cortex is the outer region of any organ. So we have a cortex here, which means we are also gonna have a medulla, and the medulla is inside here. The renal medulla is the inner region and it's made of, of something called renal pyramids. So here we have a renal pyramid right here. And the renal pyramid is a conical structure that has a little nipple-like tip called the renal papilla. So basically what happens is blood is being filtered, we're generating filtrate, and that filtrate is moving from the cortex up here into the medulla and then whatever is left behind is going to be drained from our renal papilla over here into something called a minor calyx. So here's a good example of a minor calyx. It's a funnel-like structure that basically collects the filtrate or collects the urine, and then it's gonna drain it into the renal pelvis. So we have both minor calyces and two minor calyces then drain into the major calyx. The way that I remember the minor calyx is that if you look at it really closely, what does it look like? It looks like Shrek ears, which is pretty darn cool. So the minor calyces drain into the major calyx, which then drains into an area called the renal pelvis. This is a main collecting area for urine that's gonna leave the kidneys. Okay, draining out of the renal pelvis, we then have our ureter, which is gonna go towards our urinary bladder. And just to point out here, although we'll see them again in a minute, we do have a renal artery and renal vein that are coming into the kidney. Remember, the kidney is a very vascular organ that at times is accepting more than 25% of the cardiac output of the body. All right, now let's talk about the vasculature of the kidney. As I said before, the kidney is a very vascular organ, which is important because the kidney's primary job is to filter blood of excess water, metabolic waste, etc. So over here we have the renal artery, which is carrying high pressure blood into the kidney. That then branches off into something called the segmental artery. And the segmental artery then becomes something called the interlobar artery as it goes up in between the renal lobes. That interlobar artery then arches over here to become something called the arcuate artery. The arcuate artery then has uh, offshoots which are called cortical radiate arteries going here and here. Now if we look at the uh, veins, they're very much the same way. We've got our renal vein down here, and then that branches off into a segmental vein, interlobar veins, arcuate veins, and then cortical radiate veins coming off this way. Now another type of blood vessel I should point out right here are, these are the peritubular capillaries. And remember, capillaries are very leaky blood vessels. And this is a primary site where reabsorption is gonna happen. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Okay, now that we've had an overview of the anatomy of the kidney, we're gonna take a look at the functional units of the kidney, which are called nephrons. The nephrons are these white structures right here, and they're responsible for the three major processes that the kidneys do. That is filtration, secretion, and reabsorption. Before we can learn how these processes work, it's important that we learn about the anatomy of the nephrons and the surrounding tissues. So first of all, let's orient ourselves. This area out here, remember, was the outside of the kidney, and this is called the renal cortex. The area in here is the renal medulla, which is deep to the cortex. 
Now, an important note is that the environment inside the kidney gets higher osmolality as we move from cortex down to medulla. Basically, it gets saltier, and that's important for the function of the nephrons. So let's take a look at the structures up here in the cortex. So first of all, right here, you have something called the renal corpuscle. The renal corpuscle is a structure composed of something called the Bowman's capsule and also the glomerulus. So here you can see a structure, there is a glomerulus, this is a capillary bed, and then surrounding it is the Bowman's capsule. The glomerulus is a very leaky capillary bed that's under high pressure, and under that pressure some fluid leaks out of the capillary bed and enters the Bowman's capsule. After it does that, it enters this part, which is called the renal tubule. Now the renal tubule has many different parts as well. So the first part of the renal tubule right here is called the proximal convoluted tubule. We call it proximal because it's close to the renal corpuscle and convoluted because look, it's wavy. Okay. So the filtrate or fluid then moves through the proximal convoluted tubule down into the next part of the renal tubule, which is called the loop of Henle. And we have a descending loop of Henle and then an ascending loop of Henle. And that comes back up to a structure called, you might have guessed by now, the distal convoluted tubule. Distal because it's further away from the glomerulus and convoluted because once again it's wavy. So we move the filtrate from the distal convoluted tubule into this big tree trunk structure right here, which is called the collecting duct. Now basically the collecting duct is the conduit to the renal papilla and eventually the renal pelvis. Any fluid that remains in here once we get past this point is going to end up in the urinary bladder to be uh, urinated away. Okay, now let's take a look at the renal corpuscle. If you remember before, I said the renal corpuscle consists of the glomerulus as well as the Bowman's capsule. Now let's look at the structures that contribute to its anatomy and physiology. First of all, leading into the renal corpuscle is a structure called the afferent arterial. Afferent arterial carries high pressure blood into the glomerulus, which is right here. The glomerulus is a high pressure capillary bed that is very, very leaky. And so stuff leaks out and ends up here in the Bowman's capsule. Now, the glomerulus is covered with something called podocyte cells, which are shown here. These podocyte cells create something called a slit membrane that helps to regulate what can pass out of the glomerulus. Things that can pass out of the glomerulus are generally things like electrolytes, uh, water, uh, sugars, things like that. Stuff that remains inside the blood vessels, however, are larger structures like proteins and blood cells. So that excess stuff that doesn't get filtered out ends up leaving the glomerulus through something called the afferent arterial. Okay, other structures I should point out here is that this was the Bowman's capsule and any of the fluid that was filtered and ends up here then moves into something called the renal tubule. The renal tubule is part of our nephron and this part would be specifically the proximal convoluted tubule. Last but not least, I want to point out this structure right here. This is called the macula densa and it sits in between the afferent and efferent arterial. It's basically part of the distal convoluted tubule, but it's important because it helps to regulate blood pressure inside the glomerulus. All right, let's talk about what happens to the urine after it leaves the kidneys via the ureters. The urine travels via the ureters to the urinary bladder. And so what you can see right here is a cross section or sagittal section of the male urinary bladder. What you should notice first up top is that we have a layer of peritoneum covering the top side of the bladder. Underneath that is a thick muscular layer that is made up of the detrusor muscle. The detrusor muscle is the muscle that helps to micturate or void the urine during the micturation reflex. It's smooth muscle and it's involuntary. Basically, this muscle begins to contract after we have as little as 200 mils of fluid inside the urinary bladder. And that's what gives you that sort of, oh, I need a pee feeling. Now, fortunately, you do have voluntary control over this, at least as an adult, so you can wait to micturate at a time that's more convenient. So let's take a look at what's inside the bladder here. There's a large mucosal layer inside the bladder we can see here, and that mucosal layer is divided into rugae, which are these fold-like structures here. Remember, we saw rugae inside the digestive tract as well. Up at the front of the urinary bladder, we can see a smooth triangular region called the trigone. The trigone is basically defined by the urinary bladder neck, as well as the uteric orifices. This is where the ureters are emptying the urine into the urinary bladder. Once it goes there, it's then gonna go down to the neck of the urinary bladder and enter the urethra, which is right here. Okay, now let's take a look at some sex differences in the urinary anatomy between males and females. And what we have right here is a cross section or sagittal section of the male urinary tract, including the urinary bladder and the urethra. So the urinary bladder drains into the neck of the bladder, and then we have the urethra. 
in guys, that urethra is actually divided into two or three parts. The first major part we have here is something called the prostatic urethra. And this urethra travels through the prostate gland. Now, as guys get older, the prostate gland enlarges and impinges upon that uh, urethral uh, diameter, and that makes it difficult to urinate. Now, past that, we have something called the penile urethra or spongy urethra, and it's rather long in men. And that ends at the end here in our external urethral orifice. Okay, let's take a look at the structures that control urination, and those are our sphincters. We have two sphincters here, an internal urethral sphincter, which is located around the neck of the urinary bladder, and this is smooth muscle and involuntary. The only voluntary part is located down here, and this is called the external urethral sphincter. It is skeletal muscle, and it is voluntary. So this gives all humans above, let's say, the age of three or four, the ability to control their micturation reflex. Okay, now let's take a look at the female urinary anatomy. Let's orient ourselves first. The structure we have here is the bladder. This structure is, anybody guess? The uterus, that's right. So we've got bladder, uterus, and then what is this? Rectum, so don't get those things confused. Going up top, we have our bladder here. And just like males, we have the neck of the bladder, which leads to the urethra. Now females really only have one urethra and it's a lot shorter than in males. And they also have an internal urethral sphincter and an external urethral sphincter. The internal one, again, is smooth muscle and involuntary, and the external one is skeletal muscle and voluntarily controlled. An important note here about the length of the urethra. Females have a much shorter urethra than males, and as a result, they tend to have more common urinary tract infections because bacteria from the colon or the reproductive tract can actually travel up this very short uh, tube and end up in the bladders and eventually even the kidneys. Okay, now that we've had an overview of the macroscopic anatomy of the kidneys and urinary bladder, we're gonna go back and take a look at the microscopic or histological anatomy of these structures. So what we have here is a 4X uh, micrograph of the kidney. And what you can see up top, this is the renal cortex, the outer area of the kidney, and down below, this is the renal medulla. Now, up in the cortex, you can see a lot of these ball-like structures. Those were our renal corpuscles consisting of our glomerulus and our Bowman's capsules. And then over here, you can actually see almost a complete nephron. We have the Bowman's capsule, and below it, we have the renal tubule going way down into the medulla. This would be what we call a juxtamedullary nephron. Okay, we're now taking a closer look at the kidney histology. So now we're at about 400X. And what you can see here are these ball-like structures that we saw less clearly in the previous slide. And remember, these structures were called the renal corpuscle. The renal corpuscle consists of two parts, a glomerulus, which was a capillary bed, as well as the Bowman's capsule that surrounds it. So these structures correspond to other structures on the model of love. So glomerulus here, glomerulus there. Okay, Bowman's capsule, which is the outside, Bowman's capsule. So the filtrate from the glomerulus moves into the Bowman's capsule. Simple as that. Now, other structures we can see here are this tube right here, and this tube is part of the renal tubule, part of the nephron, and that first part of the renal tubule is called the proximal convoluted tubule. So this tube here corresponds to that tube there. Simple as simple can be. So other structures we can see here is something called the macula densa. That was a structure probably right about here. And this is a modified part of the distal convoluted tubule, which sits right in between the afferent and efferent arterioles, and it helps to modify the blood pressure of the glomerulus. Last but not least, we can see some vertical tubes going down here and all the way away. They're either part of a renal tubule or more likely part of the collecting duct. And remember the job of the collecting duct was to drain the excess filtrate, what's gonna become urine, uh, down towards the renal papilla and into the calyces and eventually into the renal pelvis. Okay, last but not least, what fascinating journey through the urinary system would be complete without a histological analysis of the urinary bladder? And so what we have here is the urinary bladder at approximately 10X magnification. So what you can see up top, up here would be the lumen of the urinary bladder, that is the hollow part where the urine is, and then right below that is the mucosal layer right here, and that mucosal layer is composed of transitional epithelium. These are called transitional epithelium because the cells look a little bit columnar to cupoidal when the bladder is relaxed, but they look more stretched or flattened, uh, squamous-like when the bladder is distended. Now, right below that transitional layer, we have a layer of connective tissue, and this is often called the adventitia layer right here, or sometimes the submucosa. 
And then below that, we have a very, very thick layer of muscular fibers called our muscularis layer. And this is primarily our detrusor muscle. Remember, the detrusor muscle is made up of smooth muscle, and it consists of longitudinal bundles, it consists of more circular bundles like down here, and that's all helping to generate pressure on the bladder to help void that urine when it's time to micturate. Hello, anatomy students. To cap off this little mini module on the urinary system, I just want to give you a brief explanation of the functionality of the nephrons. Remember before we said that the nephron was the smallest functional unit of the kidney, and we said that the nephron is divided into two main parts, the renal corpuscle and the renal tubule. The renal corpuscle is this circular area right up here, which we can see, and it consists of a glomerulus and also a Bowman's capsule. Now the glomerulus, we said, was a very leaky capillary bed. Stuff leaks out of the glomerulus and enters the Bowman's capsule. This is called filtrate, and this is the process of filtration. After leaving the Bowman's capsule, this filtrate will enter the renal tubule, which is divided into a proximal convoluted tubule, a loop of Henle, the distal convoluted tubule, and this all leads to a collecting duct. Remember that anything that stays in the collecting duct by the time it gets to the end will end up in the urine. Now let's talk about the major three processes that happen inside of a nephron. The first of these processes is called filtration. Filtration is the pressure-driven movement of fluid uh, from the glomerulus into the Bowman's capsule. For example, you can see right here that we have the Bowman's capsule and the glomerulus is going into it, and that blood pressure, glomerular blood pressure, is forcing some of the solutes and some of the water into the Bowman's capsule, and that's happening right here. The second process that happens in nephron is something called reabsorption. Reabsorption is the movement of water and solutes from the renal tubule back into the bloodstream. So it's basically going in the opposite direction of filtration. And the reason we have reabsorption is a lot of stuff gets filtered out that we want to hang on to. Remember that filtration was based on the size of the things. So pretty much everything that was small enough got filtered out and ended up in the renal tubule. And this consists of some metabolic waste we want to get rid of, like urea, but it also consists of things that we might want to hang on to, like glucose. And so reabsorption is a process whereby we can grab back the stuff that we want to hang, to, hang on to and then pass it back into the bloodstream. And so here you can see the process of reabsorption right here. Stuff is passed out of the renal tubule and back in the bloodstream where it can be hung on to. Okay, the third process here is called secretion. Secretion is operating in the same direction as filtration. That is, it's taking stuff that was inside the bloodstream and putting it in the renal tubule. Remember that everything that remains in the renal tubule and the collecting duct uh, could eventually become part of the urine. So this is a way to get rid of some of the stuff that we inadvertently reabsorbed and, or didn't get rid of uh, fully the first time around. So secretion goes from the bloodstream back into the renal tubule. Now the big important part I want you to re realize is that reabsorption is the one process that's really adjustable. Uh, filtration, not so much, but reabsorption definitely is. So we'll talk about in the next module on urinalysis and physiology of the urinary system, how the hormones like ADH modify what is reabsorbed back in the bloodstream, and that's determined based on the hypothalamus and other uh, endocrine glands and hormones in the body.